Hello, and welcome to the virtual AWP Conference and Book Fair. I am Michelle Aielli, a new member of the AWP Board of Directors. For accessibility, I'd like to offer a physical description of myself. I am a white woman with dark hair that's braided to the side. I'm wearing a black sweater, um, gold earrings, and very electric blue nail polish. We are delighted to bring you this event today. Before we introduce our feature presenters, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Kundaman, sponsors of today's event. Our literary partners and sponsors allow AWP to present these extraordinary literary events and help us keep our conference affordable and accessible. A thank you to all our conference sponsors and partners for their support and participation. This event is taking place live on March 4th from 1.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Central Time. After the conclusion of this event, it will be available for on-demand viewing. This event is being live captioned through stream text. Please find the link to access stream text from your browser in the event description. A transcript of the event will be available for on-demand viewing. During the live event, please enter your questions or comments into the platform chat box on the right of the screen. Time permitting, there will be a brief Q&A where the moderator will take questions from the platform chat. If you are watching on demand, feel free to continue to leave comments in the chat box to the right of the video. We thank you so much for attending and for your continued support of AWP. We hope you enjoy this event. Hello everyone and welcome to Kundiman's AWP 2020 feature reading featuring Mira Jacob, Crystal Hannah Kim, and Monique Chong. I'm Kyle Lucia Wu, Kundiman's Programs and Communications Director, and I'm pleased to introduce today's reading. For accessibility purposes, I'd like to describe my appearance. I'm a biracial Chinese American woman with black hair and brown eyes, and I'm wearing red paper crane earrings and a white shirt. Founded in 2004, Kundiman is a literary nonprofit dedicated to nurturing writers and readers of Asian American literature. Through online classes, mentorship programs, our annual retreat, and readings like this one, we seek to uplift the storytellers of our community and create a space where Asian Americans can explore through art the unique challenges of the diaspora. More than 250 fellows have attended our annual retreat, and our fellows have published over 290 books since Kandiman's inception in 2004, a radical transformation in the literary landscape. We are part of the Poetry Coalition, and this month we are doing a postcard project based on the theme of poetry and environmental justice. Though many of our in-person programs are currently on pause, we have just concluded a virtual mentorship lab, which is a six month program open to emerging Asian American writers in poetry, fiction, and creative nonfiction. And we are currently running our feminist writing workshop with the Asian American Feminist Collective. We are currently offering a series of online craft classes and workshops, many of which are open to all writers of color. If you'd like to learn more about us, please find us online at our website at kundimon.org or on social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the handle Kundimon Forever. Today, we are thrilled to present two of our favorite writers, Mira Jacob and Monique Chung, in a reading followed by a discussion with the wonderful Crystal Hanekin. Thank you so much to everyone at AWP for your work organizing and working with us as literary partners, and thank you to everyone who's tuning in. I have the honor of introducing Crystal, and then we will get the program started. Crystal Hannah Kim is the author of If You Leave Me, which was a bookless editor's choice title and named a best book of 2018 by the Washington Post, Literary Hub, the New York Post, and Nylon, among others. She was a 2021 Jerome Hill Artist Finalist, a 2017 Penn America Dow Short Story Prize winner, and has received scholarships from Breadloaf Writers Conference, Sewanee Writers Conference, and Hedgebrook. Her work has been published in Elle Magazine, The Paris Review, Guernica, and elsewhere. She teaches at Columbia University and is a contributing editor at Apogee Journal. Welcome, Crystal. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Kyle, for that introduction. Thank you, Kundaman and AWP and all the viewers out there. You know, I'm thrilled to be here as a moderator. 
for accessibility purposes, I'd like to describe myself. I'm a 34 year old Korean American woman with long dark brown hair. And I'm wearing a green v-neck shirt and I have a very white plain background because you know we're working from home and I'm in my bedroom. <laughs> so it is my pleasure now to introduce our two authors here. Monique Trong is the Vietnamese American author of The Book of Salt, Bitter in the Mouth, and The Sweetest Fruits. Recipient of a Robert W. Bingham Fellowship, Harder Fellowship, U.S. Japan Creative Artists Fellowship, and Guggenheim Fellowship. She is a former refugee, an essayist, lyricist, librettist, avid eater, and retired intellectual property attorney, more or less in that order. She serves as vice president of the Authors Guild and is a member of the Creative Advisory Council for Hedgebrook and the board of directors of the Authors Registry. Mira Jacob is the author and illustrator of Good Talk, a memoir in conversations. Her critically acclaimed novel, The Sleepwalker's Guide to Dancing, was a Barnes and Noble Discover New Writers pick, shortlisted for India's Tata First Literature Award, and longlisted for the Brooklyn Literary Eagles Prize. She currently teaches at the New School and she is a founding faculty member of the MFA program at Randolph College. She's a co-founder of Pete's reading series in Brooklyn where she spent 13 years bringing literary fiction, nonfiction and poetry to Williamsburg. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband, documentary filmmaker Judd Rothstein and their son. Now Monique will be reading first from her latest novel, The Sweetest Fruits. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much, Crystal. Uh, thank you to AWP and to Kundaman for inviting me to take part in this. I'm so thrilled. Um, for accessibility purposes, I'll describe myself. I think I'm 52 years old right now. Um, I'm a Vietnamese American woman. My hair is parted to one side. I'm sitting on a sage colored couch in my living room. Um, behind me are uh, a bookcase. On the wall are two uh, framed prints. I'm wearing a khaki colored dress with sort of a muted pattern of leaves and reddish birds. And I'm going to read today from my most recent novel. It's um, called The Sweetest Fruits, and it's told from the point of view uh, of four women, three of whom I wrote, and the fourth appears as excerpts from her own book. Um, each of the, these women played a significant role in the life of a Greek Irish Japanese author named Lafcadio Hearn, who lived from 1850 to 1904. So taken together, the voices of the women span the globe, which is apropos, as Hearn himself circumnavigated the world during his 54 years of life. Um, during his lifetime, he was considered a Western expert on Japanese ghost stories, folklore, and fairy tales. Now, this excerpt is from the point of view of his Japanese wife. Her name is Koizumi Setsu. Uh, it's 1906, and she's recalling the, the early days of her relationship with Hearn. Um, and this is right after their marriage and they're traveling together for the very first time. They're on the Western coast of Japan. The year then was uh, 1891. Setsu was 23 years old. Hearn was 41. We had timed our arrival in Hamamura for the Obon, as Nishida-san had thought that it's Bon Odori, the annual dance to welcome back the spirits of the ancestors would intrigue you. He had heard that the dance was different from village to village, 
along the Hoki coast. What Nishida-san had not anticipated was that the people of Hamamura and the nearby villages did not want a foreigner to frighten their ancestors upon their yearly return. The villagers refused to perform their bon odori in front of you, Yakumo. The innkeeper, her face wrinkled as a dried salted plum, was the one who informed me. Once the people of Hamamura had made up their minds, the other villages followed. Dispatching representatives to the inn to warn the innkeeper not to send the foreigner and his Russian men their way. The foreigner is harmless, I heard myself saying to the old woman. In his yukata and straw hat worn low, none of the returning spirits will even know her eyes, their lids pried wide open by unseen fingers, informed me that I had overstepped the bounds of honor. To deceive the ancestors on the one night of their return from the unseen world, I could see on her ashen face was an unforgivable offense. Cholera. I said to you instead, all large gatherings are forbidden. No bon odori this year. A shame, I added. Husband, you believed me. Even when the villagers of Hamamura threw fistfuls of sand at us as we departed, you believed me. Forgive me, Yakumo. But even you were not blind to their bodies, their arms tensing and uncoiling. What I feared more was their silence. The villagers thought that you would not understand if they jeered or shouted, so they did not waste their words. We were seen but unseen. We were the returning spirits, but with no families there to greet us. We had died among strangers. A curse, Yakumo. Gentle and silent was what you would say to Nishida-san upon our return to Matsue. The villagers on the Hoki coast were gentle and silent? Nishida-san asked me if those words were true. Friends of his passing through Hamamura had heard the villagers tell a very different story. My face burned with shame that I had felt at Hamamura and that I could not show there. Nishida-san quickly apologize for having made such an error in judgment. I shouldn't have sent Heron-san to the Hoki coast, he said. But he takes such pleasure from being the first, as you know, he explained. I know. I should have thought about you, Setsu, he said. It was the first and only time that Nishida-san would call me by my true name. Upon hearing Setsu released from his lips, an intimacy implied, an affection kindled, a heart so near to mine. I heard my true name for what it had been until then an afterthought in the lives of men. I know, I repeated, with a sharpness in tone that 
took him by surprise. You continue to believe, Yakumo. We would again find ourselves in remote villages where your Western face was the first. At each location you professed, and I voice for you, a keen interest in Shinto shrines, Buddhist temples, and the local folklore, superstitions, and beliefs. But the faith that you harbored within you was the one that you wanted most to find. You looked at the bodies around you and you deemed them gentle. You wanted to see in those bodies something distant and apart from the brutal ones that you had known. A body is a body, Yakumo, gentle and brutal. Nothing in truth separated yours and theirs. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful reading, Monique. Now, Mira will be reading from her graphic memoir, Good Talk, a memoir and conversations. And I think she'll be showing some slides as well. I will be, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Mira Jacob. I am a brown woman in an orange sweater that looks like it's sort of trying to eat my head, shoulder length black hair. Um, and there's probably a 12 year old wandering in the back of me at some point looking for a snack. I'm gonna be reading to you from my memoir, um, Good Talk. And hold on, I'm gonna share the screen so we can see it together. There we go. Okay. Here we go. All right. And this is gonna, um, this chap these chapters are sort of in the middle of the book. Chapter 23 only in New York. It took three days to move from my apartment in Williamsburg to Jed's in Chelsea. I mean, how much stuff can you have? Some people like to sell an actual furniture, Jed. Couches, chairs, that kind of thing. Overrated. The next morning on my way to work, a bunch of people were standing in the middle of 7th Avenue. I asked two teenage boys what was going on. A plane hit the World Trade Center. What? No way. Fucking New York City, man. I went to a payphone and called my father. Dad, you'll never guess what just happened out here. I'm watching it on the TV. You need to get out of there. Don't worry, it's way downtown. I'm on 14th. No one on the street seemed too worried. We were far enough away that we could see the gash in the building, the smoke pouring out of it, but not much else. They're gonna sue the pants off that airline, I'll tell you that. Only in New York, kids, only in New York. Boom. Are you okay? Dad, the, I don't, the other building just caught fire. It's a terrorist attack, you need to get out of there. Calm down, that's not, there's another plane. They're showing it on the TV. It just hit the other building. What? Look at the fire, Mira. It would not have spread this way. The cell phones went down. The radios went down. I started repeating what my dad was saying to a crowd. The firemen are there, but they can't get up that high. People are jumping from the windows. They're saying it's a terrorist attack. Oh my God. A woman ran up. Please, my phone isn't working. My husband's in tower two. I handed her the phone and walked into the middle of 7th Avenue with everyone else. 30 seconds later, tower two fell. Chapter 24, Paper City. After the buildings fell, the missing signs went up. They went up on subway walls and in bodegas and over the posters at movie theaters. Outside the hospitals, they became their own paper city. On our block, three people were missing. One I recognized because he was always walking his dog at 2 a.m. when Jed and I were coming home. 
Every time I saw his poster, I would imagine him in the rubble, waiting. Hang on, we're gonna find you. We learn new names, Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. All day, all night, every night, we saw their faces on the television. You guys are ruining the fucking city. What? You heard me. Then one night, I saw a picture of myself, missing since before the World Trade Center attack, last seen Monday, September 10th. I blinked and the woman in it became someone else. She had a Suriani name like mine. She had a hollow forehead like mine. She was a doctor and lived near the Twin Towers. Her husband was looking for her. She went missing the day before the buildings fell. Who was left to look for one missing person when 3,000 followed her? Later, my mom would call to tell me she was a family friend's niece. There has to be something to do. Downtown is still burning, mom. Half the wind blows and half of it is papers from other people's desks. She's a doctor. She's married. People don't just disappear. Did you just say that? You know what I mean. Every night, Jed and I would crawl into bed early and not sleep. Her husband must be going crazy. Sweetie, this isn't gonna help. After a week, I stopped watching television. I went to soup kitchens and served firefighters a few times and then there were too many of us and I stopped doing that too. No one was coming out of the rubble. The rescue crews from the other states were going home. My dad called a lot. You holding up okay? Jesus, I'm fine. Nothing happened to me. Mimo, come on. People ask everything, dad. That month, my neighbors started saying hi to each other more. Once when my grocery bag broke on the street, four different people helped me pick everything up. My boyfriend's running to get her another bag from the corner. Is she okay? You got that, honey? Everyone wanted to fix something. Nights were different. People drank and then they got weird. Leaving already? How do we know you aren't plotting to kill everyone here if you won't even talk to us? Fine, get the fuck out. In early October, I was standing in Union Square when a woman grabbed my hand. She did not speak English. She needed help. Come. What, what happened? Come, come. Are you okay? She dragged me to the wall. And I knew even before she pointed, you. That's not me. You. No, I know. It's not me. No? No. She shook her head and sighed. We looked at the picture. We were still holding hands. The woman in it looked back at us and we cried. I'm gonna stop by sharing that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mara. That was beautiful. Um, now, Monique, if you can turn your camera on, we'll start our conversation. Hi, I'm really excited to be with you both here at AWP with Kundaman. And I wanted to start first with a question that's inspired by both of your readings. So I realized that both of, uh, both of your pieces are exploring this idea of multiplicity in their identities. Setsu is this Japanese woman, but when she goes to the Japanese coast with her foreign husband, she is treated as a foreigner as well. And then Mira, in your book, uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, the New Yorkers are kind of rallying together. They, they see this like common cause because of the trauma and the helplessness. And yet you're experiencing these moments of racism and you're being seen as a foreigner as well. So I was curious about even my own identity, you know, as an Asian American, I'm often trying to figure out this duality between being seen and unseen, as Setsu says. 
So how do your multiple identities, particularly as an Asian person and an American person, but also as an illustrator and writer, how does that all influence your writing? Great question. Monique, you wanna? Sure, okay. sure. Um, yes, Crystal, uh, thank you so much for the question. It's, it's a beautiful place to begin. Um, uh, I think I'll answer it uh, this way. So I, you know, I came to the US when I was six, almost seven years old. And I, I have these very clear memories of going to school for the first time uh, in the little town that my parents and I ended up at, uh, which is in North Carolina. And I remember going home and looking in the mirror and thinking something has changed about my body something physically has altered, <laughs> you know, because at school I was being told all these things about it, that my skin was yellow, that I, my eyes were slanty, that, you know, on and on, and that there was something inherently um, uh, distasteful about it, something that made them shun me and mock me and bully me. Um, and uh, set me apart from them, right? But of course, I'm looking at the mirror, nothing has changed me. <laughs> I'm, I'm still the little seven-year-old girl, you know, that I've always seen. Um, so I think I, I begin there because to me, that was my first sort of experience was what I, I think of as the mutability of my body in this country, uh, or rather the, mutability of how my body can be perceived you know especially of course if that body right is is a non-white body within this country um i mean depending on the context and the place you know our bodies can be seen as passive can be seen as vulnerable inscrutable foreign alien monstrous dangerous and and it it was really also when I understood that depending on the context and place, I could be many different things to folks. Mm -hmm. And I had to start to begin to understand the stories, the position and the histories of all the things that I could be to them. You know, the range of East Asian ethnicities, right? That I'm not, that I am the re recipient of, of the racial epithets for, et cetera. So, I think of that as also my, my, my MO as a writer of fiction. It's an attempt to understand different stories that are not my own, right? And in order to survive. Mm. Wow, yeah, that is, Monique, I'm so glad that you started there because I feel like that is, um... I feel like the way that we experience the the otherness is from somebody telling us, right? Like that's you don't you don't you're not yourself just like other all by yourself. It's when somebody tells you at some point like you're not like everyone else. And you're like what? Um, and it is really funny the way that the that sort of ramification starts at that really young age, and then it but it also does that thing, right, of placing you outside your own body, looking at your body with an outsider's gaze. And I think part of that um, for me certainly redirected itself into writing because I was always outside my body and I was always observing how I was being observed by other people and also how, and I was also kind of watching them intensely to try to be a chameleon, to try to sort of fit in, to try to lose whatever I had that was sort of keeping me um, away from them. And in this, you know, the thing that I just read, I was just thinking, Monique, as you were talking, um, when I was a kid, I used to, I had this notebook that was basically like, it could have been titled like, I see Indians. I wouldn't have, I would have, it was just like every time I saw an, like a, a South Asian person, cause I wouldn't have even known to like call it South Asian. I grew up in New Mexico with three other East Indian families for um, a portion of my life. And, um, and I didn't, I, I wouldn't have known to, to like how to say what I was seeing, but it was literally anyone that looked vaguely like me anywhere in pop culture, I would write down in a notebook. And like this notebook contained everybody. It contained like unfortunate things like a poo to this one tampon commercial where it was like an Indian mom and her daughter. And it like, I was so excited that I remember like writing it down and be like, that's a thing, which is just to say that 
as long as I had had that notebook, I had also had this feeling of like, what are we going to be in America? What is our story going to be? Because I had very clearly understood the way that America was um, was taking on the stories, the way that America talked about Black Americans was very clear to me from the get-go. The way, because I grew up in New Mexico, that America talked about Mexican Americans also was, was really clear to me. And I was like, what is our thing gonna be? What is it gonna be with the sort of mixture of hope and dread, I would say um, in my younger years, um, which then, especially in that section I read, I mean, I had, there were definitely times before that where I was like, this isn't gonna go, this isn't gonna go well. Um, but that specific moment, 9-11 um, was the moment where I was like, oh, here, here's how it all goes really bad. Mm -hmm. Right. It was like this bridge I had been marching toward the whole time. And I was like, oh, God, we're on it now. Um, and this is what it is like. And I feel like that probably is very familiar for so many of us when we see our faces and the incidents of violence rise in America, when we're the ones targeted, where it's sort of that feeling of like, oh, here it comes. Mm -hmm. The thing that I've been dreading, the thing that I thought you meant when you said I wasn't one of you. Mm -hmm. Here it comes. And your Mira, the following chapters in your book go into that racism and xenophobia, and we're experiencing that now with the rise yeah. of racist and violent attacks against Asian Americans, particularly elders, who I think often look more foreign. And I'm just, I wonder, this is an impossible question, but do you ever think, both of you, do you ever think we'll ever reach a stage where we are American enough? Hmm. Um, I just read this really great uh, quote by, uh, you guys know the comedian Hari Kondambalu? Um, he just, I just saw this, um, this great thing where he said, where it was like, where his quote was, you pushed us to the margins, but now you're surrounded, which made me laugh this morning. Um, because I think that is a little bit of a fantasy, right? I mean, I, mm -hmm. I also have that fantasy of like, what would it mean for the power to shift? What would it mean for, and, and what, because I feel like that's what the question is, is like, is um, what would it mean to feel like you had the power that you would have if you were seen as an American? Um, and I think for me, what, what that has become is sort of the, the inverse question, which is what kind of American do you want to be? Because so much of, I think, the unpacking that I have to do is reckoning with, as I was saying before, um, how, how Black Americans are treated and how that specifically affected the way that my parents uh, assimilated into America and how that affected me and the way that I assimilated into America and looking at that and, and kind of rethinking like, what kind of America do I wanna be in? Is it that America where all of us are placed on a spectrum of importance, sometimes according to skin tone, sometimes according to cultural cachet, sometimes according to something else and sometimes each of us are sort of brought into the fold to be cherished for a moment and then shoved back out. Um, is it that America or like, or is there just a totally different fucking America that we can have, which um, I'm kind of going for at this point. Um, Mira uh, said it so well. I, I think I, the only thing I would add is that, you know, it, it really is, how do we want to define America, right? Mm -hmm. And I, how do we define citizenship within this country? Um, and I would hope that we will move more towards uh, solidarity and coalition building and, and knowing the history of, of our coming to this land. Um, and yeah, I, I think it, that's when we'll become mm -hmm. true citizens, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I'd love to talk about, I guess, becoming a true citizen in, in the literary landscape. Um, mm -hmm. And this idea of when I'm writing, I'm writing within a community and to a community, but I also do not want to speak for the community. Mm. And yet I think that with, in the publishing industry, people from marginalized communities are often asked or expected to speak for a group, right? Mira, you're talking about like that one, that one group that's going to be 
uplifted for a bit before they're pushed out. So I'm curious if you experienced that in your in your publishing kind of career. Mm. Mm. I'll, I'll let Mira begin. Oh boy. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was all ready for you. Yeah. Um, we um, have experienced it, and what's really interesting to me about that is that um, for for as much talking as we do about um, diversity and you know the range of voices and how and and kind of what that should look like and how we should all change, we not really being like I don't feel like when we say we in that direction, I'm talking about we, the publishing industry, which as we know is like over 85% usually um, white Americans. Um, when we kind of have that moment, I, you know, no matter what is going on, I'm always still in those conversations, um, whether it's like, um, it's usually on the business side, it's usually on the marketing side or the publicity side where I am still treated as a singular Mm -hmm. as the only one um and also when I go out in the world with my work I mean people say all sorts of crazy things to me like my son is dating an Indian woman and it's like that's that's your question for me I don't know <laughs> what to say about that man um and and kind of and having to sort of thread that needle but the other thing that I think of in terms of how that affects my work um is that I think it gives me a a caginess that I have to fight against all the time to get to what is vulnerable and what is interesting to me. I think when you are asked to be all of those things, you build yourself in opposition to the ask. And it's very easy to lose sight of what it is you wanted to say, right? Like if you spend all your time answering the questions and also trying to find your way out of answering the questions, you never get to what is your own voice. You never get to what is your own truth. And so, so much of what I've had to do is surround myself honestly, with a lot of, um, a lot of writers of color so that I don't feel, so that I understand how many of us are, are trying to get our own sort of singular vision out while also upholding the ideas of community. It's a really hard needle to thread. I think what I'll add to that is that, you know, uh, When, when I think about writers of color and our work in the world, you know, it's, we're, it, the, the, the world of publishing, there's a whole ecosystem, right? And there could be a lot of, you know, we can su surround ourselves with our fellow writers of color and yet when we go and try to make a living, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And we go up against that wall, that, that white wall it is not just the editors that we're talking about. I mean, that ecosystem includes yeah. the literary agents, the people who profess to, write, to teach us how to write to begin with, all that at all the grade levels, right? Um, the publicists, the marketing folks, the book reps, the people who go into bookstores and have like five seconds to sell these booksellers on our books. You know, what do they say? Who are they? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the literary critics, the curators, organizers of literary events, book festivals, librarians, on and on. That's, you know, I, I, I want people to just really open up that discussion about what it means to have a really healthy ecosystem for mm -hmm. the likes of us, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, it's not just three or four well-placed new hires, uh, black and brown editors in major houses. That that's mm -hmm. not going to cut it, folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what? That also, Monique, that made me think of the way that our books are sometimes described. I always call it like the multivitamin review, where somebody's like, "Everyone should read this important book because it is so good for us to read this important." But you know that one. <laughs> Where you're like, who are you speaking to? Because this is like, I'm not a multivitamin, and nor do like the, the people that like look like me that are reading this aren't like, I've gotten my injection of knowledge for the day. Like that's not, <laughs> that's not what we're doing here. 
<laughs> and also when, um, I mean, to, very, to be honest here, like when your book um, doesn't fit that multivitamin also, you know, sort of rubric, then your publishing house sort of runs out of things to say about you. <laughs> and they just don't know how. It's like she's, she wrote a novel, folks. She wrote a historical novel about a guy no one knows about, told from three women's point of views. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know how to sell that to you because, because we don't, yep. you know? But they mm -hmm. would if I was not me. Yeah. Right, or they would if at the center of this knowledge was the middle-aged white man having an identity crisis, right? Yeah. Like if it was like that guy and three yeah. women are talking about him, they'd be like, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> I bet that book has been written. <laughs> You know, I was so excited to be the moderator here because I feel like you both have, my book was published in 2018 and both of you have kind of paved the way. And I remember thinking that, um, I remember Monique, like your book was one of the first that I saw kind of breaking those, those barriers. And I was kind of naive because when my book was publishing or when my book was out, uh, an editor rejected it because they already had a Korean American writer. And I was kind of, I just thought that we had gone past that. And yet, no, we yeah. haven't. Right. Mm. Yeah. Right. Um, right. That's, that's so incredibly disheartening to hear that mm -hmm. your novel came out in 2018, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that someone is still saying this mm -hmm. and it's not just being laughed out of the room. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But isn't that, isn't that kind of your experience of what America's kind of, um, America's trajectory with racial awareness has kind of been? There's like the, the five people that insist like, we've already had this conversation. We don't need to have it anymore. We're way past this. And then there are the like 200 people in the rooms that will say the exact same thing while also being like, but we'd never say that thing that we are in fact saying right now in this room, mm -hmm. right? Like, there's, I just feel like there's a real a disparity between what people think they're aware of and how they actually interact in rooms, right? And how they actually talk to us in rooms and how they actually I feel like there's the projection of goodness and openness, and then there's also the reality, which which is borne out by that article, um, the one in the Times, right? That measures all of the statistics, all of the the writers of color from like the 1950s until two a couple years ago, mm -hmm. right? The numbers they haven't shifted that much. They mm -hmm. haven't changed. No. Um, well, I wanna, I know, I wanna leave time for Q and A, so I'll have one more question. Um, and I wanted to talk about shame in writing. So when I was writing my book, one of my many uncles said, you have to represent the Korean people well, right? <laughs> and I'm just thinking, I'm writing about characters. I, this is not gonna be the perfect Korean. And I had to just be okay with that, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, have you experienced that kind of the shame uh, or uh, the fear of shaming your community or your elders and how you get over that. Oh my God. I mean, Monique, do you want to go? Do you want to? Uh, my my answer is very brief. Um, I, this is why I write fiction. <laughs> um, the, the times where I've written personal essays, things that are closer to me, I find it, uh, uh, incredibly difficult and I don't like the reaction within my own, you know, sphere of family and friends, you know? Um, so, and, and so I, I would prefer to hear how Mira, Mira, <laughs> yes, because that's, in a, I mean, your book is so revealing and, and so beautiful. And oh, thank beautiful. you. That's so, um, that's so nice of you to say. I also, I mean, it's really funny because I didn't uh, set out to write a memoir. I thought I was just going to write a bunch of conversations. Um, and then as it, as it went, as kind of things heated up, I started writing it in 2015 and as things heated up and as my in-laws became avid Trump supporters and as America sort of dissolved into the, whatever the hell it is now, as all of that happened, I just, I remember just having this moment where I was like, I'm just going to talk about all of it. I can't, I can't not 
do this anymore. I can't pretend anymore. And I did have, by the way, like in my head, I had the sort of, it's not like the Greek chorus, it's sort of the Indian chorus of aunties, <laughs> like ashamed aunties that are like, oh no, not this, not the bisexuality, like not all the people you've slept with. You know what I mean? Just all that stuff where I was like, this isn't gonna, this isn't gonna make anyone proud. But then the other part of that too is, um, like, as you were saying, Monique, like, this is why I write because I don't think I am in any way singular, like the, with either my sexual preferences or the amount of illicit substances I may have taken or how many times I've gotten my heart broken or all the other extremely mortifying things that, um, that I would supposedly expose about us, but that everyone else, everyone else is just living with quietly because they don't want to shame us in a larger stage and like what is the I just always wonder like what's the point if you don't ever get to know yourself mm -hmm. like what's the point if you never get to own what you are if you never get to see it with each other if you never get to like love the parts of yourself that are even much less than beautiful much less than brave if you never get to kind of hold those moments with other people, if you always have to hide them because you are so scared of the scrutiny, then what do you have at the end of the day? Um, and that's, I think a lot of that is what motivates me is the idea that, um, that there are so many of us, there are so many of us that have these things that are, and they're not in fact shames. They're just, they're just ways that we are moving through the world and we've been told to be silent about. Mm -hmm. But if we weren't, right? And just getting back to that idea of like, what would the America that you want to live, live in look like? Like if we weren't, if we weren't too ashamed to be who we are, what would that look like? That's really beautiful. And I think your book and your book, Monique, I think all of our books out there, the more diverse publishing gets, the more people will not be ashamed or will know that they don't have to be ashamed of their multiple backgrounds, right? I hope so. I mean, that's what, didn't that do that for you when you read books like that? When you're, mm. you know, like I remember the books where I felt seen. I remember the books where I was like, oh, mm -hmm. oh my God. There's a, like, there's a new space for me to be in because I've never seen it before. Like it's all, it's all white girls having heartbreak on television. Yes, yes. <laughs> but like here's so something else. So true. And even in um, books, I feel like I didn't read an Asian American author until college. Mm. Well, how sad and devastating is that and That's I'm just devastating. hoping that it's going to be different mm -hmm. for future generations yeah um yeah, I want to I want to leave time for questions so people please write your questions in the chat uh we already have one um wait, wait let me find it how can the difference between diversity and liberation impact the publishing world mm. You have to define those things a little bit, but I'm, I'm, what I'm reading into that question is um, because diversity is sort of a, it's almost like um, a checklist, right? Diversity is a thing where you're like, I've done the diversity thing where liberation is not needing the checklist because it mm. is inherently, that's the way I'm taking that, inherently being um, addressed. Mm. How would that impact the publishing world? I, I have a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the pocketbooks <laughs> of the people <laughs> who work there, you know, you cannot talk about liberation if you're mm. paying someone a paltry amount of money and expecting that their parents or their family wealth, mm -hmm. you know, subsidize their apartment and their their living expenses. Who are you going to get? in there. Yeah, you might get a couple of black and brown and Asian faces, but of a very particular economic totally. strata. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. not liberation. You know, pay people a living wage. <laughs> I remember yeah. when I graduated from college, I got a job at Random House, a job offer which I could not accept because it was like something less than working at a mm -hmm. McDonald's mm -hmm. in the city of New York, Yeah, you know? So I went and I became um, a paralegal, which was mm. 
the beginning of a horrible like <laughs> series of mistakes. <laughs> and I would have preferred to have been a random house as mm-hmm. someone's lowly assistant and move up the ranks, you know? Yeah. And I think that same, you know, um, person is out there, you know, mm-hmm. uh, continues to be out there thinking, I want this job, I can't take this job. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. Liberation. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That actually, that I had a, um, I have a piece in the book about, about that, about being offered, I think it was a Vanity Fair, like research position yes. for like, you know, like just no money. And I remember being like, I have to have what are the five other jobs that I can get so I can support this one. And it was like, well, none, really Mm -hmm. none, you know, you're just going to have to, you're going to have to do it differently. Um, And I I agree with that. I also, I I do think that idea of, um, and Monique, I just, I hope, I so appreciate what you're saying. The idea of like, of just making it a very tangible thing. Like we talk about these things as though they're very far out, but there's just very tangible realities that can shift around this. So like along with that, like where are you putting your publicity dollars? Where, who are you mm-hmm. pushing your marketing toward? How are you like, how does that marketing team put together? Do you know what I mean? Like, how are you doing the kind of deep level thinking? How are you reaching the people? Like, cause I the thing that frustrates me the most is this idea of like, well, we put the work out there, but you know, nobody, reach for it. It's like, what were you doing to engage those communities? You've spent a lifetime of not engaging those communities. What did you do to walk into those communities and say, here's a book that may or, you know, that might be for you. Like, what did you do to make that happen? That I would love to see as well. Yes. And not expect us to do it. You know, educate oh, yeah, yourselves. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> um, I, there's a question for me, you, Mira. If you wrote another graphic novel, would you continue using the same illustration style? Um, I, you know, I draw all sorts of things, um, and I, but I use the backgrounds I use are always photographic. I, I can draw backgrounds. The reason that I do it that way is I like the, I like the facility with which I can get to the heart of the story very quickly. Um, and, and I like the idea of, of being able to kind of drive dialogue very quickly across pages. But that said, like, you know, if you would have asked me whatever, five years ago, if I would have drawn a book, I would have said, absolutely not. That's a crazy Mm. thing to do. I'm a novelist. So I would never say that I wouldn't try something new. It's always, I always feel best when I'm doing something new, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, We have another question for you both from Grace. How do you intend to keep growing as artists? In what ways do you keep challenging yourselves as writers? Uh, What are your current goals or intentions? Mm. Mm. Great. Yeah. Great question. Great question. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, on my end, it's, um, I've been collaborating with Mm. people. Can you imagine? You know, like if you, um, like Mira, you know, if you had told me uh, 10 years ago that collaborating with someone was something that I would want to do, (laughs) I would laugh you out of the room. I mean, (laughs) you know, but, since I started working with composers, um, you know, writing lyrics and, and, and working on libretto, um, I love, oops, um, oh, mm. I haven't worn earrings in so long. I'm like, what is this thing? It really is, it, the collaboration process is something that, um, pushes me to sort of know where my strengths are and where my weaknesses are to, 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 to just really um, just work differently, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that's how I'm, I'm, you know, learning something new. Yeah. Um, to, to that point, I am also um, deep in collaboration. I'm writing a pilot right now, which feels really fun um, because I do like um, I do like dialogue so much and, um, and I love setting up scenes, but specifically Monique, I, I want to echo what you were saying about collaboration because also it ties in Crystal to what you were saying before about like being the lone voice and being asked to hold the lone voice and like trudging mm-hmm. up the hill of your lone voiceness <laughs> and how like lonely that can get, how absurd it can feel. Um, it really does feel amazing to hook into the process of creating with other people. Right. And to like into that sort of expansiveness, it feels like allowing yourself 
um, what for me has only ever seemed like a luxury and a distant planet. And it feels like, no, it's not like, it's actually not a distant planet. You just, you kind of just walk across the room. You kind of just walk across the room and open yourself to the idea that like your say does not have to be the, the final say. You can bend, you can flow, you can figure out how to do this. You can figure out how to get your ideas out in a lot of different ways. Mm, that's beautiful. I want to watch this opera. Is it opera? Libretto? Yes. Yes. I want to watch this opera. I want to watch the show. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> um, I think we have time for another question or two if anyone wants to add them into the chat. Let me see. Um, and then while we're waiting for that, so the Kundaman, the description for this event was that we were going to talk about food, but I didn't get oh. to it. Oh. So let's talk about food a little bit. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious because I feel like some people find this like a hate, a hated question because I think that Asian Americans are often asked about food, you know? Um, I was asked a lot about food in my book, but also I love eating. I love writing about food. So <laughs> I, it's, so it's, you know, I didn't mind, but it is kind of like a love it, a hate it question, I think. Or is this a beloved question for you or what are your thoughts? I mean, I have a lot of, I, I feel like I'm a champion eater. Like it's like <laughs> my Olympic sport. I'm great at it. And also when I, when I um, looked at my um, novel, my first book, I realized that there were like 27 dinner scenes in there. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I had to, like, go through and cut a few dinner scenes. I was like, these people are only ever eating. That's apparently all I want people to do is eat and fight at the same time. <laughs> that's, like, that's the nexus of human connection to me. Um, but yeah, I think that I think I understand the reason that we run from it. I can also feel like uh, there's a joke between me and my partner about how many times we go to a wedding on his side of the family and somebody basically just walks up to me out of the blue and is like, you know, Marty in food once. Disaster. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that, man. I'm really sorry. So I like I like controlling the food dialogue, is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, Crystal, clearly, I, uh, I, uh, my safe space is food, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but, um, and so, you know, I mean, really, I'm thinking about food right now, like what I'm going to have after we're done with our little get together here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's a beloved question for me, um, um, because to me, food is very much about ritual, you know, and and food is a nonverbal language. And sometimes the only language that I ever sort of understand, you know, I love you, mm. <laughs> you know, for, in terms of coming from my family, you know? Mm. So yes, of course, you know, um, the only thing that I do not like about, you know, questions about food, of course, is, is that how, how food and, and folks who write about food, uh, it's, such a, it's such a gendered subject, mm. right? Um, oh, that's such a good point. We mm -hmm. see, you know, that somehow my, our work um, are not literary enough or important enough or significant enough if there is too much food in it, mm. right? But if a man writes about food, it's, 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 it's somehow- It's soft tender soul. <laughs> yeah. it's a big book it's about culture you know um so yeah that's that's the only time when I feel like you know if you're going to talk to me about food come to me on the same plane that I've presented my food writing to you you know mm -hmm. which is not just something on a plate right it's it's all the things that I said ritual language mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and um yeah creativity right love i love <laughs> that yes love <laughs> i mm. think um we're at you know the end of our time i wish okay. we could talk more but this was so wonderful thank you both for your readings and for talking with such honesty and grace and love um i hope we can all eat a meal together at some point Krista, yours is amazing. Thank you so much. And Kundaman, I'm so thrilled. This was really fun. So thank you, thank you for doing this.
Yes. Thank, thank you, you so all. much.